Hey, this is Arlen McKinley, and you're listening to the Art City Music Podcast. Welcome to the Arch City Music Podcast. We are live in the barn studio, and we have a special guest online with us right now. We have Mr. Arlo McKinley from Cincinnati, Ohio. Arlo, how are you? I'm good. How are you, my friend? Doing good. Hey, speaking of Cincinnati, I was kind of looking over your tour dates, and uh, you got a big one coming up. I wouldn't say it's your uh, it's a normal gig that you do, but you're going to be actually be singing the national anthem at the Reds game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, Yeah, I'll be doing it July sometime yeah late july i believe yeah that's like a dream come true right yeah yeah for sure i mean it's something that like we had brought up i mean probably over a year ago trying to make happen and it was one of those things we just kind of threw out not really thinking we'd ever really make it happen but i don't know now we're here and i'm doing it but yeah i'm a i don't know being from cincinnati always living here big reds fan yeah sure it's kind of hard to be sometimes that they don't always (laughs) do the best but yeah, it's uh, I'm excited about that. Pretty cool. I'm actually more nervous about that than like, I don't get too nervous on shows. But I mean, you can't you can't mess that song up. Yeah, so, yeah. So I'll gotta make sure that I'm on. Yeah, make sure that I've got it. But yeah, I'm super excited about it. I bet so. And you know, we're from the St. Louis area, so baseball is in our blood, and we've had some rivalries with the Reds in the past. But uh, I, and you know, the it that night that I'm doing it, we're playing, we're playing you guys. Oh, so. no kidding. No <laughs> yeah, kidding. Yeah, we're playing the Cardinals. Maybe we should check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, come on down for it, for sure. It'll, uh, it'll be good. Yeah, I, I've never understood that rivalry, though, like, because we don't really rival each other in anything else. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I remember the All-Star game was here a few years ago, and everyone was getting love. But I, I think, I think you guys are maybe just, hated across the board <laughs> Any, yeah. anytime a st louis player would get announced that whole place would just like erupt in like booze <laughs> but I, and i was like why do why do they hate these guys so much yeah. <laughs> but i don't know it was uh it's kind of it was kind of fun but they took it well yeah. but yeah baseball's always a uh, been a been a cool little thing here in the history with baseball here in cincinnati like the reds played the first i think night game ever if i'm not mistaken first oh, cool first stadium i think with a. Uh, with like lights for night games. So there's like a good baseball history here. We were involved in the, the old White Sox scandal and all that. Yeah. From So, yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah, it's a cool thing. So I'm glad we uh, landed it. So I got a yeah. baseball question for you. And I, I think I know the way you're going to go with this, but Pete Rose <laughs> in the Hall of Fame. It's uh, 100%. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he just got caught. That's all. <laughs> yeah. like, that, I mean, and I, I mean, and time goes by. I mean, if we're, living in a world where you get second chances at a lot of other things and i mean and he just contributed so much to the sport yeah. i don't know i don't know if that guy was can't deny him but um i think i think that's how a lot of people feel i don't know if they'll i don't know if they'll ever give in on that i think they're just making an example of him or trying to make an example of him or something yeah and so long has passed you think some of that would fade but it feels like the more <laughs> that it passes they're like no we're not gonna you know about about face now no, right, yeah, that, that, I didn't that. That's it. That's what I think. They're like, no, oh, we've we've stuck to it this long. Yeah. Why change? And I mean, yeah, I don't know if that'll ever change. It. I, I don't know if that's just me or not. I don't know if it's just sound bad or not. But I really don't see what he did is so like crazy yeah. wrong. Like I don't know. There's, I'm sure if I looked at everyone that was in the Hall of Fame that oh I could gosh find something on people <laughs> yeah. that, that's probably a little worse than gambling on some games or something betting on games it's not like he was like fixing them or anything so yeah but yeah pete rose i I think i think if you're in cincinnati you have to love him 
And, you know, I grew up a Cardinals fan since I can remember. Uh, but Pete Rose was somebody I always idolized because Charlie Hustle, right? He's the guy that's going to outwork everybody. And he's, he's yeah. running over catchers in the All-Star game. Like, you had to like yeah. that guy. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever ran into a person – that's been like no i don't like pete rose like you're having <laughs> baseballs like i don't know he's just you think of that era of baseball he was a major major part of it yeah yeah th- those, those are the good days for us and <laughs> but we haven't had that in a while this is a music podcast and you are a musician so maybe we should talk a little music although i could talk sports all day yeah i mean i can talk about anything yeah i'm, I'm good <laughs> right so uh my first question is how jet lagged are you you know because i think you've been over in Germany and Denmark and all over the place. I, yeah, I've been back less than it'll be like a week tomorrow. I think that I've been back and I'm still, yeah, I'm still getting my my uh, my bearings under me, trying to get back to normal life, normal schedules. Yeah, we did eight countries in like two and a half weeks. Man, and went over there with my guitar player Chad Light, and uh, yeah, it, it was crazy. It was my first time over there, but it was one of the coolest experiences i've ever that i've ever had you didn't do the full band and so it was more like acoustic yeah yeah yeah. i was gonna go uh by myself but like because i had some makeup shows because i was supposed to go over and do some shows with sierra farrell earlier in the year and those kind of fell through so i had some makeup dates on my own and then hooked up with the old boy tour over there and um yeah, so I was like, man, I need someone to go over with me. So, yeah, so uh, yeah, it was my first time over there, and then took my took my guitar player, pedal steel player, over there with me, and we just we were just winging it. Neither one of us uh, thought about telling our phone providers that we were leaving the country. So, <laughs> the hold of anyone, like, I'm I'm actually pretty proud of us for how we uh, how we made it work. Came back in one piece and with a bunch of bunch of memories and. Kind of with a better understanding on how this music thing's working out for me. Like when you're in like in Sweden, I had to stop in the middle of the show and just <laughs> remind everyone like how crazy it was to hear everyone singing songs back to me. Like I'm like, you guys speak a different language. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like and you guys are just singing these songs back to me. I was like, I hope you know how crazy this is for me. And it, it was just a, I don't know, it's just a different experience. Yeah, I don't know. know probably pretty cool too and i I know uh so you you've been over there and then you have a little bit of break it seems like uh, or at least tour wise and then you're getting ready to go back out on tour for for a little bit we're going to be catching you july 29th at the old rock house july 29th in st louis arlo mckinley at the old rock house we're going to be catching you there and we're pretty excited about that yeah we were uh, trying to figure out if i had played there before but i don't i don't think that i have i don't know if i've actually ever played in st louis i've played outside of it in other spots in missouri but i don't think i've ever been there but i have some friends in like columbia missouri and all that will go there and uh, i know they're all coming out we always get missouri comes out shows us some love so i'm excited for it but yeah this in uh this entire year is going to be pretty pretty much just on the road with the new record coming out and everything so it's going to be i'm going to be tired yeah i bet so You've been pretty open, and it's uh, it's it's a little bit refreshing. You've been pretty open about some of your, you know, maybe past struggles, you know, with with addiction or you know even some mental health stuff. And uh, like I said, that's pretty refreshing to hear. You don't hear a lot of people, especially guys, talk about that. And I think it's good for mental health advocates such as myself to to hear other guys talk about it to make it, you know, more in the in the language and, and in the conversations that we're having today. But being on the road specifically. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of temptation there. And I'm sure even like with some of the mental health stuff, there's, you know, I'm guessing a little bit of maybe loneliness at times or missing home at times or whatever it might be. You know, just going on the road, you, you feel that effect when you're on the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel that stuff all the time. And I am very open about it. Um, just I, I think we need to kind of let the stigma of these uh, issues of addiction and mental health and that kind of stuff kind of, you know, they'll probably never go away, but you know, the dialogue needs to be there and people need to know that they're not going through that stuff alone. And it's usually people who, the people who don't want to talk about it or think it, think that it are, think it's like an issue or something we shouldn't talk about. Are people that have never dealt with it. Yes. I, that, that's how I usually see it. But the road is kind of, I don't know. It can go either way. A lot of times it kind of helps me, I think, and it'll keep my mind busy and stuff like that. Knowing that I have something to do and like just out there playing music, 
and doing what you love is good. But and but then on the other hand, like you said, it's temptations. Everybody wants a everybody wants to go home with the story. Yeah, like, I was band, you know, or I did this. I, I mean, you just have to kind of it's a balancing thing. But I, now I usually just I don't know. I kind of just play the show and sort of I'll talk to fans for a second and then just kind of get out. But it's sort of it definitely can be rough. And it's not. I was just saying this a bit ago. Like the road's definitely not like as glamorous as some people might think. Yeah. Like yeah. People are like, "Oh man, I bet your job's awesome." <laughs> no, man, not really. Like it depends on what you think's awesome, but it's not. It is. It's, I mean, it's like you're just away from people. You're away from your friends. You're away from people you're in relationships with, and all that. And and then you have like so. Like I said, some people want just a story, and you just I'm just surrounded. But I, I don't know. And that kind of makes it sound like I'm saying that everyone's like that and that's not the case but i don't know it's just you just kind of have to be aware of, of what's around you but it's not i try to look at it in the other way though is that it's kind of a positive thing i kind of think i'm at my best believe when i'm on the road because it's giving me time to sort of clear my head of everything else and just focus completely on like shows but it is um it's a little bit of both but you know, I think the thing about being open about all this stuff is needed and i think it's starting to happen a little more people are being a little more open about about the stuff so yeah it's just yeah the road's a tricky thing yeah you know as a listener as a music fan it's like you're talking about you know when i go see a band or see an artist perform i see that one hour window of their life you know where everybody's yelling their name or they're yelling out songs or singing the songs and it looks really glamorized but it's like you know i think of uh bob seger turn the page you know Opinion. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's probably one of the greatest road songs ever where he, he shines a light that it's like truck stop after truck stop. And, you know, uh -huh. people looking at you weird because you're basically, a, you know, like a troubadour, like a vagabond that's on the road, you know, where it's where it's a little bit different. Yeah. I and mean, we were we were talking about this uh, last time we were on the road. I think it was the last time, but like in the van with each other, like it kind of goes like the first week. Everyone's like super excited and, you know, everyone's like buddies and everything's going on but then like when you're traveling with like five six other people in, in a vehicle all day long to like go to show and then all night long and then you know just to play the shows the show's the only break from from the drive and i mean you end up i mean when you're that close to people for that long i mean it gets pretty rough so by like the second week everyone you can tell who's getting moody and who's, <laughs> who's kind of starting to feel it and then i mean by the end of it you're just ready for it to be over yeah but yeah but then but then you get home and you're like bummed out because it is over it's it's such a weird thing how it works with me but it's i don't know those shows though that little hour moment though kind of makes it all worth it just playing and connecting with the crowd and stuff but i mean that is the only part of it that is really anything that's like special or big or anything like i mean the rest is just a bunch of driving yeah. and and just being around people and hearing the same stories and then towards the end nobody's talking like <laughs> it's just, but it's yeah i don't know it's a weird thing it always starts out real exciting always ends everyone's ready to get back and then no one talks for about a week <laughs> and then everyone starts talking about like oh, i can't wait to get back out it's just it's a strange it's a strange thing. I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you really try this for a yeah. <laughs> career. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's, it's weird. I just kind of fell into it. So. so I mentioned off air before we came on air that uh, me and my wife actually drove down. I was so in love with uh, uh, Diamond Midwestern. I mean, every track on that album, I just love. I think it's a perfect album, and I don't say that often. And yeah, uh, I was just dying to see you. And, uh, you know, we were kind of coming out of the COVID stuff a couple years ago, or you were playing down in Nashville. So me and my wife actually drove down to see you at uh, 3rd and Lindsley. And, man, I, it was great. It was absolutely great. Your show was awesome. The band was on fire. And uh, it was a special night for us. And that was a special night for me. That show had a had a pretty had like a feel to it. I thought that I hadn't seen in a while, and then I also had just switched bandmates or you know band members. Had a whole new band except my pedal steel player uh, Chad, who had stuck it out with me, who I kept. But um, that show was kind of surprised me in a way because I didn't really like our Nashville. Sh my Nashville shows are always like kind of hit hit or miss, but that one there was like a there's a weird little energy I think there. But that uh. That show was the beginning of tour, so that's probably also too why I felt good. Because, like I was saying, yeah. beginning of tour is always fun. <laughs> but it was a, yeah, it was just a it. It shows certain shows just have a feel to it that kind of remind me why I'm 
doing what I'm doing. And that was definitely one of them. Like everyone was just very, everyone's on the same page for a little bit. Yeah. And I think when that happens, it shows and you kind of can forget about everything else that's going on in the world for a minute. I mean, that's kind of my goal anyway. It's just for, I mean, leave politics and religion and everything, whatever those beliefs are outside for an hour and a half and just come enjoy something with everyone else. And that, that was one of those nights. Yeah, that was that was a fun show for sure. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. We talk to a lot of different musicians. It's just that shared experience, escapism, right? We we don't have to think about work. We don't have to think about bills or whatever else it is. We can just yeah. watch the guy on the stage and he can, you know, I, and I love some of your merch. I've seen some of the merch where it's uh, like even the baby, the baby uh, onesie where it's like Arlo made me cry. <laughs> right, yeah. And I am just a sucker for what I call, and I, I'm not the one that coined this term, but like old sad bastard music, like old, oh, yeah. old right. jukebox songs at the end of the bar, you know, drinking your problems away. I just love that <laughs> stuff. And, and I feel like, yeah, I feel like you're one of the heavy hitters in that sort of, and it's cool that you embrace it too. Like Arlo made me cry kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I think we, we kind of came up with that as like a, as a joke in a way, but we like I'd gotten, I mean, we had seen it happen so many times, like there's people and which is a good thing. So I'm not like knocking it at all, but like, I mean, we just saw how the music was connected with some people. And then like, I mean, so many people would come up after like, Oh, you had, I mean, you had me in tears. All that stuff. I was like, it's like, we got to make this shirt. <laughs> and then we did, <laughs> but, and I'm not like trying to be like the, the sad dude. Cause I mean, overall I'm, you know, I'm getting by, but I mean, I'm just thinking about my life really. So I, it, I'm just glad that people are relating to that and possibly just seeing that they're not alone in some of the things and that there's a person up there that's willing to put it out. I couldn't write songs any other way. Like I can't really write fiction. I can't just come up with a situation or story in my mind. So I just have to take experiences from my life and put it out there. And I also think that's how I deal with a lot of stuff because I'm not that great at, like, I, I try to avoid conflict at all, at all costs. I try to like just get along with everybody and move on. I think just I get things out and songs and just the response that people have to it are amazing. Like some of the emails that I get and stuff are just absolutely insane heavy. Like just some of the things that um, people have said that I've helped them get through. And it's just, it, it always, it's, it's one of the biggest compliments. Some of these, even though they're like bad situations, it's almost like the biggest compliment that I could receive just to know that something that I created that my, that I went through in my life ended up affecting someone however far away or close or whatever that, that I don't know, just someone that I don't know, I guess that could relate to it. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of what I've always wanted out of it. Really. I guess if there was anything I've ever wanted out of it, that would be it. And speaking of, you care if I play a couple songs and we can kind of talk about them a little bit? No, not at all. Here, Do it. Let's see if you've heard this one before. You want it, I can feel it Got a bag of pills I've been dealing So I can take you drinking Don't tell me about a love thing We'll get high and talk until How important was Bag of Pills for your career? That song is, without that song, I probably wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And that's the second song that I've ever written. Wow. Like in, in my life. That song, when I recorded it, it was already over like 15 years old, probably close to 20. I did that when I was in a, I wrote that song when I was in a band with Jeremy Pinnell uh, okay. called, Great, called The Great Depression. And we just didn't, it had never been released in, um, like well, there had been like some video versions of it or whatever, but I went down when I first started doing this project, I went to do this little video session that I wasn't even going to do bag of pills at, but I just hadn't done it in a long time. And for some reason, I don't know why I just wanted to do it. Like I hadn't been doing it with the band that I had at the time or anything. I, I did it. It was the summer sessions video that's up and, and to like 4.1 million views like that. It just, I don't know what it was about that song that started, taken off with people and i i really just did it because i hadn't played it in a long time i just wanted to play something different and but that song's super important to me that was the um almost everyone says that that's the was their introduction to me and uh even though it's the second song i ever wrote i just like the first real song i think i wrote about there that i wrote that 
led to the kind of songwriting that I do because yeah. that is also a, that's a couple true stories there put together in that song. <laughs> but yeah. it's all like that opening line is definitely a true story. And, and it's, I don't know from that point on, I don't know. I just, when I wrote that song, I wouldn't have ever thought that that it would come back 15, 20 years later and kind of make a career for myself. So that song has been, been good to me. If all these songs kids that's probably my favorite kid <laughs> yeah yeah you kind of hear musicians <laughs> talk about that a lot the songs being their babies <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's what i mean uh, when i was in making the new record with matt ross thing we were talking about that our, our the new album being a being our new and favorite baby yeah. so <laughs> and speaking of the new album you have a new album this mess we're in july 15th it's going to be dropping so here in a couple weeks how are you feeling about the album coming out in a couple weeks i, I love it i'm excited i'm finally um I'm glad that the, it's finally here, uh, the time for it to come out. I'm more proud of this record than anything I've ever done musically. And um, yeah, I'm excited for it. And the response to it so far has been good. It's it's different from Diamond Western in some ways. I think it's I think it's a, about half of it is the Diamond Western ish, and then the other half is maybe the direction that the next record will be in. It's just the uh, the main thing I. I think it's probably every musician's goal though. The main thing I didn't want to do was just make the same record again. Yeah. So this one, and not that Diamond Western was rushed, but when I went to Memphis and recorded it, like I think I was only down there for maybe seven days or something for Diamond Western. And this time I went down and got a spot to stay and I was down there for like 15 days, something like that. And we probably, I was in the studio probably 12, 12 of those days, like just, working coming up with ideas and and sonically is or yeah, musically and just uh, it, it's different uh songwriting wise i think it's still the same but i just kind of wanted it to just kind of represent the last little bit or like the time from code or pretty much the period from diamond western up until that point so it's just songs and stories that are in between there but with the musically it's different i, I think yeah. and and uh, I don't know. I'm 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 happy with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super happy with it. I'm excited, and it's uh, yeah, it's crazy. That's finally finally coming out. So, uh, and everything that I've heard on it, absolutely love. It does sound different, but it's very Arlo in the same sense. So, uh, th yeah, that's this mess we're in is coming out July 15. Basically, where every everywhere you can get music, right? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be everywhere. So yeah, we've got like for all the vinyl collectors. I think we're like six like six different vinyl variants coming out and, oh, cool. which I think you can like pre-order now and all that but yeah it's cool I mean this whole process has been cool with this record it's just been it's been different and Diamond Western was the first was like the first time I'd ever done anything that wasn't like doing it myself it was the first time I went and worked with a real producer and then I had a label behind me so it was just a new experience that I think some of my nerves kind of got in the way of certain things but this one was I was much more I think comfortable like I like Diamond Western a lot. I don't. I'm. I do think it's. I'm proud of it as well. But this one just. This one feels more like me. I think than than Diamond Western. I guess Diamond Western was me at the time. But this one, overall feel is. It, it's the record I wanted to make. So I'm. I can at least just say that it, I went down there and did exactly what I wanted to do. And hopefully it. Uh, hopefully people enjoy it. Okay. So far, so far, so good. Yeah. Can we hear a cut off of it? Yeah. Yeah. This one's back home. Talk about a jukebox song. Yeah, yeah. I could I could shoot a couple of games of pool to that one. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, and like like I was saying before, so I, I mean that's a song that probably could have ended up on Diamond Western if, if I like. So yeah, that's still the sound still there. And the, the, with that song also, like uh, that when I started this project in 2010, 2011, that was the second song that I'd ever 
written. So that one, besides that one, they're all like within the last year or so. And then for some reason, I wanted to put that album, like it just seemed to fit if there is a storyline. I don't know if there necessarily is on the new record that is kind of fit. So, and um, I, I hadn't recorded that song ever. So I wanted to put that on there. So, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, I enjoy that song. That song also has my uh, little nephew, Logan Halstead, singing the second verse on there. Yeah. So, I saw an interview where you're talking where, you know, it's called Back Home, but, you know, I don't think, at least in this interview, you were talking about where home can mean a lot of different things. It can mean places and, and your physical home, or it can mean people or something that feels like home. I love that you were kind of just referencing home in, in a more of a general sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And that's, I mean, I think it's, that's, I think that song is about being comfortable. And I think that's what I think in the song and that song home means comfort, a place of comfort, wherever that is. And whether that's in your, that's in your mind or physically where you're at, like, yeah, exactly that. It's just, I think that song is just sort of about going and, and kind of getting yourself out of your comfort zone or not, or just change kind of like changing and not going back to where you were or who you were, things like that. But yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I'm glad that song made it onto the, uh, onto the record for sure. Yeah. And I know this, this album, the mess we're in out July 15th is dedicated to your, to your mother that passed away. Is this, is this your most personal record that you've put out or piece of work that you've put out? Yes. Yeah. Without, without a, uh, without a doubt. This is, um, yeah. And that's why this record is like important to me. I'm proud of it. It's that, I mean, my mother passed away right before Diamond Western was released. And then shortly before that lost a, uh, lost a best friend to to the drug battle and, and that stuff. So I'm just, I don't know. I often say it's an album about like about growth in a way, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just kind of just trying to, I don't know, just sort of facing life, I guess, these things and have, having to move on from, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, there's nothing on this record that I don't talk about. And it's a very personal record to me. And not that Diamond Western wasn't, but I think that one's more just a collection of songs. Mm-hmm. And I think this one is, has a little bit more of a, of a story running through it. Feels yeah. a little bit more complete, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I got to ask you about, I see you playing this old beat up Gibson a lot. <laughs> yeah. What's the story behind that? Well, first of all, does, does she have a name and uh, you get, is there, what's the story and backline behind that? There is no name, um, but it's yeah, the Gibson J forty five. It's yeah, it's actually uh, it's actually the guitar that I taught myself how to like play on. And that's my it's my dad's old guitar that had been in the oh, cool. been in my house since I was a kid. And um and like I was teaching myself like power chords. I was on like punk music and oh yeah, I was trying to learn some so- social distortion songs. And <laughs> yeah, that's that was the goal. Talk, and, talk about good songwriters. Yeah, I was doing like this, and I mean, it's easy yeah. up there. Yeah. And yeah, the Gibson started uh, when I was doing the band, the old duo band with Jeremy Pinnell. I, like that was in my later, maybe early 20s or something, or I don't even know if I was 20 yet. My dad would let me take it out and play, and then he finally ended up giving it to me when he saw that this was the route I was taking, and uh, I ended up beating the hell out of it. And <laughs> <laughs> there was, ended up cracked, and there was, holes in it and i never thought i was gonna get to play it again but um my manager has a uh, music shop down in uh lewisburg west virginia and he was like let me see what i can do with it and um yeah he fixed it up brought it back to me and uh yeah i've played it ever since so that's a, it's i've been playing that guitar almost my whole life wow. and minus the years that i had it put up because of the holes <laughs> but you know but yeah, I think I think the I think the, the way it looks now it gives us some character. Yeah, but, um, I love those old guitars because it just you wonder about all the backstories and all the songs that's been written on them. And oh yeah, even seeing it, you do you could do kind of see where some repair work was was done. I think on the <laughs> yeah. front side, and so I was like, yeah, I bet there's a story there. <laughs> yeah, that guitar has seen more crazy things than most humans. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, that it's. It's kind of crazy when I think about it, when I sit and talk about it like that, because I don't think about that often, about that being the first guitar that I ever like really picked up. And 
really tried to like learn on or anything like that. It's it's still with me and, and I yeah, I care about that guitar a whole lot. So I was super happy when I got to play it again for the first time. Uh thinking about possibly retiring it soon. Just I think she's getting a little uh getting a little run down. But yeah. uh it's definitely my 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 guitar to ride on for sure. But we'll see. We'll see. I I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll have a talk with it and uh, see <laughs> see how it's feeling. But I know I know it's got one more good tour in it. So that's awesome. We're joined here by Arlo McKinley. This is the Yard City Music Podcast. We're going to be checking out, seeing Arlo July 29th at the Old Rock House in St. Louis, Missouri. You guys, if you're listening to this, are going to go and get the album before that, July 15th. This mess we're in. I cannot let you out of here, Arlo, without talking about my favorite Arlo McKinley song. Yeah, yeah. Well, what would that one be? Let's see. <laughs> song <laughs> thank you yeah that one's uh yeah yeah i like that song i like that one's uh, your favorite as well yeah. i like hearing <laughs> but yeah that song is when i knew i was in the uh well, when i recorded that song is when that's the moment i realized i was in really good hands with matt ross bang uh producing my album because when i, I songs that i send to him is are usually just me playing acoustic and i kind of let him I, like, I trust his ear and his mind and the way he thinks about music is just incredible to me. And like when I walked in, I did not think that's how that song was going to end up. Because I have an older version with my band that's just kind of slow and anything. But then when I, he wanted to try something out with it and just kind of gave it that like little choppy groove. And I was, I, I don't know, I just would have never thought to put it that way. And then from that moment on, I was like, I don't think I'll ever make a record with anyone else but Matt. Yeah. So it was a... Uh, yeah, that was the moment. But yeah, I love the way that that song turned out. And I got to give him pretty much all the credit yeah. on that one. And he's the producer on this new record as well, right? Yes. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, I'd never, never met him before, uh, before Diamond Weston. We were talking about producers and his name came up and I realized that he had engineered a lot of the albums I was listening to at the time, a lot of the Jason Isbell stuff, some Margo stuff. He was engineering a lot of the Dave Cobb produced albums. Hmm. And I was like, okay. And I knew that he had worked on the, he had produced the Margo album and that I, he got a Grammy for. And I don't know, I like, I kind of like all the other names that kind of came up were people that had already, not not that he wasn't established, not saying that at all, it comes off wrong, but it's, I wasn't aware of him yet. And then I was like, this guy just sounds interesting. I want to go with this guy. And it's the best choice I could have possibly made. And he just, Get, he gets what I'm trying to do, and um, and it's just I don't know because you always kind of have a, at least I did I kind of had to worry about you know meeting a producer and you know are they going to change these songs are they going to do whatever and and I mean he doesn't he doesn't do anything like that we work as a team very well like I almost think his name should be on these albums in some ways because he he really does do so much to them and puts in a lot of a lot of hard work into it. Yeah. yeah, he's the guy. On some of the definitely Diamond Western and the new stuff that I'm hearing, uh, some of the engineering is so – it gives it such a live feel, and I think it's just – it's not compressed down to where it just sounds like one sound. It feels alive when you're listening to it. And yeah, well, well, we record that way, and that's another thing I love about him because that's how I like recording. We all get in a room and record at the same time and try to, try to not do overdubs as much as possible. So the first – track will be everyone in the room playing so and then if something needs to be added or something we'll go back but a lot of times once it's done it's done yeah we don't like i, I just think you lose something sometimes when you are all like okay we're gonna do the bass and drums now 
now vocal like there's just an energy that you get from being in a room playing with other people and and i believe i don't know if that's another thing i'd heard him say that he likes when i was researching him i was listening to some podcasts and he said he just likes to catch the energy of a room of people playing in that appealed to me yeah so so yeah that's uh it comes off that way because that's kind of pretty much what's going on there I think it's mission accomplished because it does. Your stuff sounds like a live record. And, you know, I know a lot of people listen to music in a different way. I like to put headphones on. So yeah. another thing, and especially if we're talking about Suicidal Saturday Night, the panning on that, it kind of moves, right? It kind of moves yep. back and forth. And I think maybe even some stuff is like deadpanned to your right or to your left. And it just yep. gives it that uh, that live feeling. And, and a, it feels a live. Right. That's definitely it. And headphones, I think, are the way to kind of, to kind of go with music because you hear things you can hear just you hear every little thing so i guess you have a good little set of headphones on so but yeah that's uh that's kind of the i don't know i want it i want my record to feel that way and i just like i said i can't really record any other way that that's just my comfortable that's what's comfortable for me so i'm glad that he likes to do it the same way but yeah. well, whatever you're doing brother it's working man we are <laughs> Thanks, man. we are fans we're going to be catching you July 29th at the Old Rock House in St. Louis, Missouri. The Arch City Music Podcast will be there live in attendance. And we are going to absolutely get that record and all the vinyls for this mess we're in, released July 15th. Uh, super excited to hear the rest of the songs on that. I needed to do a quick shout out to Allie and Greg of Shorefire Media for setting up this interview. You can go to ArloMcKinley.com and get all the information you need on Arlo and everything Arlo. And we're going to be checking you July 29th at the Old Rock House, man. Yeah, thanks, man. I'll see you there. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, brother.